You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. I recently went on William Ramsey Investigates' YouTube channel to speak with William Ramsey and author Gary Meese about the West Memphis Three's new claim that the state of Arkansas has lost their evidence. The West Memphis Three were convicted twice of the murder of Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Chris Byers, once by jury, and a second time when they took the Alford plea. Gary Meese has written three books on the case and knows more about it than any other human I have encountered. It was a lively and candid discussion. Thank you, William Ramsey, for having me on. It was a good time. Take a listen. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On today's show, I have a very special guest, returning guest. Her name is Roberta Glass. If you're familiar with my show, uh, we've done many, many, many interviews, uh, many on different subjects, uh, innocence fraud, um, a lot of stories about what we're going to talk about tonight, which is the West Memphis Three. And I was hoping to have Gary Meese, uh, the author of Blood on Black and Where the Monsters Go, to be with us today. But he seems to have either gotten the time, time or out wrong or something. But uh, he also compiled his books into one book, which is The Case Against the West Memphis Three Killers. And I was hoping to talk with him and Roberta about kind of updates, things that are happening uh, that are concurrently taking place kind of with the, with the West Memphis Three. And if you can go back in some of my other uh, interviews, I've done one with Gary Meese uh, in 2020, April 2020, titled Gary Meese and the Not Forgotten West Memphis Three, because there was something being banded around that by particularly one individual whose name I will not name, he will name him later, but he said the Forgotten West Memphis Three was his title. Um, so that was one you can go back and look back. And Gary has done a lot of interviews about the West Memphis Three on his podcast, which is The Case Against with Gary Meese. I think he's at 92 or 93 interviews, and he's done kind of followed the subject matter that I was hoping to talk to him about tonight. Um, and I'll put his show in the links. And uh, Roberta and I talked about West, Mark Furman's West Memphis Three documentary back in September of 2020. <laughs> Then in 2018, I think I'm going to repost that is we did kind of a round table talking about the West Memphis Three. It was kind of a discussion and kind of covered some people. And that was uh, June 2018. And I've done an interview with the high school student, interestingly, reached out to me from New York and said, would you be willing to talk to me about this whole case? And so I talked to some teenage kid and you can go back and look at that on one of my shows. At, uh, that's from 2017. But Really, this this what we're going to talk about tonight is kind of this whole new move of this new evidence that supposedly showed up with uh, the West Memphis Street, which is kind of causing consternation among the innocence fraudsters, in my opinion, the innocence fraudsters. But I think the people who've been around the West Memphis Three are kind of just rolling their eyes and uh, kind of going, oh, no, not over again. So we can talk more about that. So Roberta Glass of the True Crime Report, welcome to the show. Thanks for... Uh, Thank you. That that 2017 interview you that uh, you did with the high school kid is fantastic. Yeah. It's one of my favorite episodes. It was nice to just have him too, because it was just somebody kind of with a clean slate. He really kind of wanted to know, ask good questions and kind of unbiased questions. So it was it's one of those interviews not all interviews go great so it was one of those interviews that went really well yes great questions really great questions yeah, he was really sharp. Yeah. yeah so um you know unfortunately gary's not here hopefully he'll pop in but can you talk about some of this stuff i mean i know that you're more seem more familiar than i am but i know really the issue is is that in the evidence locker there's supposedly new evidence that they've uncovered which could you know, overthrow the guilty convictions of these guys. And so they're going in and so on social media and really on the news, all on the national media, they're talking about, you know, trying to unlock and unseal and, and go through this evidence. Can you talk about that? Well, I think let's go back to the Alfred plea. Okay. <laughs> uh, Not Alfred, Al Alford. Right? Alford, yeah. Alford, Alford please. 
with my very heavy uh, New York accent. Um, that is a guilty plea, as you and I often point out. And it's it's you can maintain your innocence. So it gives you it's it's a kind of idea that everybody wins. So you're letting the convicted whatever out or off the hook in some ways, but it's legally, they can maintain their innocence, but they're admitting that, or acknowledging that there is enough evidence, the prosecution has enough evidence to convict you or had, has enough evidence to convict you. So both sides, but it's legally a guilty plea. And when they signed the Alfred plea, they also signed a, I'm giving up all claims to sue um, or any legal uh, claims. Now, the West Memphis Three took that and said, see, they made us take this plea because they didn't want us to sue the state for millions of dollars in Arkansas. Because, And whether you can do that in Arkansas, I've heard... Uh, I heard you can, I, but I've heard you can. I think it, it gets a little bit more complicated, but okay. But they made a big deal out of it, but it was their own lawyers who asked for this Alford deal after they tested the DNA evidence in 2011, I believe, right? Or did they get out in, was that the- 2011, that's right. August, 2011 was the date. So their defense team saw this, these DNA results. They came out and 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 asked for this Alfred plea. So why did they why did they do that? You would I think you would think that maybe those DNA results weren't too great. Nobody's seen them to this day. And they haven't done anything. Then they waited until they got out and they said, We're gonna we <laughs> I'm talking about their their PR conference that they gave all at this giant table with all their billions of lawyers behind them. It's amazing. I encourage everyone to watch their PR conference that they gave. They gave this PR conference where they said, Eccles said and Baldwin that we're going to work from the outside to exonerate ourselves. We can do more work from the outside. Eccles is dying here. And Baldwin said, I did him a favor. I didn't want to take this deal. I wanted to totally exonerate myself legally, but since Damien's dying, and then they all applaud him. It's so crazy. So they gave up all claims. They waited until it all ran out. The time, the time frame ran out for them to test this evidence. And then they said, oh, they've lost the evidence. The evidence is destroyed. Oh, no, it's not. Now we want to test it. That's where it's basically too little, too late. And I think they waited for a safe zone where they can't do anything with this evidence. <laughs> and it's, it's basically a big push for more money for them. Please donate. And that was made a plea where he asked for more donations. So, so he has. So he's asked for more money and he's moving too right now. So on his social media, I think he's headed to Louisiana. So I don't think he's doing too well financially as far as the the high life that he was used to he moved out of new york and my theory on that i don't know him personally or his circumstances is it had something to do with the high rents in new york so might have something to do maybe his uh, celebrity was, i'm sorry his celebrity pals have uh, the the resources have dried up might right well thing. the first time he stayed in peter jackson's apartment i thought for a while or some one of those stars homes and then and then he got his own place in harlem so <laughs> and he said that this is my spiritual home i'm never gonna leave and then all of a sudden he's leaving so and i understand i mean new york is very different because of um what's going on in the world but i i think ultimately it comes down to money i think so uh, okay here's gary he's in I'm going uh, oh, to invite him to the stream. All right, you ready? Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. Gary, can you hear me? Let me look. You need to unmute your unmute your mic. You've muted your mic, so you have to unmute it. I thought I unmuted it earlier. Uh, I've been having various technical problems, and oh, some other stuff came up, so I'm sorry. 
no worries. I did a very long intro. We're just at the very beginning of the conversation. Roberta was talking kind of about the background situation with the evidence. I mentioned you're at kind of like 92 or 93 episodes on your podcast, and you've covered evidence. What evidence was, I think, the most recent one that you put up? Yeah. Um, can you kind of talk? Maybe you can just follow on with Roberta and go through this kind of new pitch that involves uh, the so-called new evidence that's been kept by the West Memphis police for 29 years or 27 years. Okay. Uh, can you ahead, talk about Roberta. the Roberta Live? She, or, she kind of just finished her first intro statement, so maybe you can follow on right now. Is that no, okay? I mean, I mean what, what happened with this was no, nobody was talking about this until two years ago, and then Bob Ruff, for his oxygen special, I guess he had to come up with something. So he came up with the idea that new DNA testing would solve the case as if it's not solved. And uh, he did approach the other, the other, uh, all, all three of the, uh, uh, the convicted men. And uh, they, you know, he had to chase Jesse, Jell Jesse Miskelly down uh, to a trailer someplace and, bang on his bedroom door and holler at him through the door if it was okay with him. And I guess, yes, he had a toothache or something, but he, that's what he said. But anyway, he said, yeah, okay, whatever. And then, and then, and then uh, uh, Baldwin and Eccles agreed, but there was not really, a no, there wasn't a noticeable lack of enthusiasm from them about this. Uh, Bob claims that, you know, this, uh, the, Impact testing, which is out of the lab based, it's it's not testing, but uh, extraction. And uh, uh, there's a lab in California that does this. Is you know a new technology that that wasn't available to them before. Of course, it it, it, it was pretty new back in 2011 when the the killers were uh, released on a um, out at the Alfred plea, which is a guilty plea, but they can say they're innocent. Um, it was available back then. It was pretty new. It wasn't really well known, but those extraction methods were available then. So they can't really claim it's a new form of extraction to get DNA, uh, but uh, maybe the courts will listen to it anyway. You never know what a court's going to do if they actually ever get it to court. The, the, the bottom line with this, more than anything else, is they have not really taken the formal legal actions they need to take to get any kind of retesting done. And uh, the problem that the that uh, Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly have is they, they signed off on uh, their rights to take any form of, of, of uh, legal action concerning this particular case uh, to the state again in the courts uh, because uh, that was part of their plea deal. They signed off on all that. Uh, and they had some very high-priced lawyers standing over their shoulders when they signed. So uh, I don't really know how they can go back and uh, even ask the court to do this and a, a court actually listen to them. What, what they, how they got the... In, they did get in through the door in the sense that they were asking about the evidence and first at first it was the new, there's a new prosecuting attorney, not the former Scott, uh, former prosecuting attorney, Scott Ellington. There's a new prosecuting attorney as of, well, he's a little bit, been there a little bit over a year now, uh, Keith Cressman. And he repeated to one of the defense attorneys some story he'd heard that some of the evidence may have been lost or destroyed. Now, there, there were a couple of pieces of evidence that were lost, no longer available back in 2011. And they knew that and they didn't make an issue out of it then. Those pieces of evidence being the paper bags in which they stored the evidence and paper bags being the standard method for storing evidence because it, it, it doesn't uh, retain moisture. It doesn't mold and mildew and all that. It, the, you know, everything it, it, it's a very good way of 
storing evidence. At least it was at that time. I don't know if they've improved improved what they do with that. And the other evidence is evidence I would like to know more about, which is the stomach contents from the three boys. But they, that wasn't preserved either. So um, anyway, uh, what happened was Ruff got his audience to, well, really basically harass the prosecuting attorney about uh, turning over the evidence. And he made it sound as if he was going to just show up at the at the door, bang on the door hard enough, and the attorney, the prosecuting attorney, was just going to hand the evidence over to him to be tested. I mean, that's honestly how it sounded. That's not how it was ever going to work. But I don't know if Bob knew that or not. But uh, what had happened is they had okay. Cressman said he'd heard that some of the evidence was lost or destroyed. This caused a big furor in the supporter scene. And uh, there, and he didn't say say it as if he had firsthand knowledge, but you know he'd been in some communication with the West Memphis Police Department, and had somehow gotten that idea. I don't know why he repeated this to, without checking it out further, repeated this to the defense attorney. Maybe he didn't. Maybe they made it. I don't really know what happened there as far as the conversation, but anyway, that it, that came out, and then this was followed up by. Uh, the present mayor of West Memphis, Marco McClendon, stating that he heard that some of the evidence was burned up in a fire back in 2006, I think he said. Uh, Marco McClendon, I, 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 I mean, I've interviewed the guy. Uh, I talked to him several times when he was on the city council back in 2013, 2014, probably 2011 as well. And and I mostly got calls from his ex-girlfriend complaining about him stalking her, but <laughs> truthfully, he was that was that was in the, he was mostly in the news at that time for that. But uh, anyway, he he is not really the most reliable source of information on much of anything. He's kind of a blowhard, and uh, he and Bob have that in common. And anyway, but he said that this evidence. He thought some of the evidence was burned up in a fire. So the, the explosions and the supporter scene just continued. And Eccles, without Eccles, hadn't said very little about uh, the evidence at all for years. And except for complaining about how he'd been mistreated, he really didn't talk a whole lot about the case. And, uh, you know, claimed he'd never seen the Paradise Lost movies at one point. And, uh, and Baldwin, Miss Kelly's totally missing from the the media scene. And uh, Baldwin uh, very rarely ever said anything about it, except to complain about how he worked had had to work as a child in the slave fields of Arkansas as a prisoner. <laughs> That's about it. That was about it for years. Anyway, but they started making a fairly big deal about this missing evidence, and Eccles was intimating that you know. Uh, this might negate his, uh, his uh, guilty plea because they didn't have the evidence when they he agreed to the uh, agreed to the Alfred plea. Uh, he also made some suggestions along the lines that this they might uh, incur some sort of civil penalties for having lost his evidence. In other words, he saw a payday coming. Well, th they had negotiations for. Months and finally, uh, one of the attorneys, Patrick Binka, in Arkansas, filed a motion with the court, and th that's how they got into got back into the court with this. Is you know, a, a missing evidence in the case cracked the door open just wide enough so the Binka could make this motion. And but he, he uh, but he was suing the mostly suing the. He, he was trying to get information for the West Memphis PD. What happened is the West Memphis PD kept ignoring their Freedom of Information Act uh, request, uh, on which um, amounts to paperwork explaining their storage procedures and, you know, basically just accounting for how they've handled the West Memphis 3 evidence over the last 28, almost 29 years. 20, it's really around 28, 29 years, depending on when they gathered the evidence. Anyway, uh, 
they so they just simply stonewalled him. And uh, he now when this first began, Ruff was communicating with Scott Ellington. And Scott Ellington apparently led Ruff, Ruff along just as long as he possibly could with the idea, oh, yeah, Bob, we're going to give you the evidence. And then he stonewalled him and, and basically weaseled out of the deal. He, knew, he lucked into a judgeship in Arkansas, which is why he's no longer the prosecuting attorney. And there's a new prosecuting attorney. A prosecuting attorney there, and you know now it's out of Ellington's hands now, which I'm sure he's very happy about. Uh, Binka continued filing and complaining, and then with with the courts that uh, he was being mis, you know that the West Memphis Police Department was violating these standards. Uh, the res response was that they weren't. And uh, then Mara Leverett said uh, that there was a court order. She wrote this stuff. She wrote this many times. That there was a court order that the West Memphis Police Department was going to have to uh, answer to about uh, coming up with an explanation on this evidence. Well, there never was a court order, but she's persisted with that meme, you know, up to today, as far as I know. And um, Anyway, it turns out there was never a court order. There hasn't been any court action on, on any front with this in months. What happened was there was continuing negotiations between Binka and the West Memphis Police Department. And finally, they said, oh, well, yeah, come over here and look at the evidence. They come, Binka goes over there. He looks at the evidence. And it turns out that, and he comes back and says, oh, yeah, it's well cataloged. It's complete. There aren't any problems with it. And he, of course, he spins this as good news because now we can go have it retested. The problem is, is he hasn't take he hasn't taken any action to have it retested. Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly haven't taken any action to have it retested. I don't think they actually can do it. I mean, it's his their attorney. I don't think Vika can actually do it. Um, there was a fire. It was in 2016. Uh, there were. No evidence related to the West Memphis Three case was destroyed in that fire. A couple of pistols were stolen out of a container and somebody set a fire. Uh, and it's not clear if the evidence in that container was any of that was actually West Memphis Three evidence or not at this point. I was misreading. I mis misread that for a while and thought it was actually West Memphis Three evidence and actually the more I looked at the story, I finally figured out that it doesn't really even say that much. So um, as it stands right now, it's mostly after it's mostly Eccles at this point still griping about the reports that they were lied to about the evidence being missing. And a bit of unfortunate timing in West Memphis is this very same day that Bank comes goes and checks out the evidence, the police chief, West Memphis, resigns. Apparently this had been in the, it was a few days before Christmas. Apparently this had been in the works for a while. Uh, Eccles said that, you know, he, he had all this inside information that Michael Pope was being forced to resign because of his handling of the West Memphis Three matter the West Memphis Police Department said, no, this wasn't the case. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, there had been a lot of, he'd only been police chief for six months, so he really missed most of this controversy. Uh, it turns out that uh, he, there had been ongoing dis disputes among all sorts of things between Pope and Marco McLendon, the mayor, and uh, particularly concerning uh, Pope's handling of personnel and so forth. So it's very questionable whether it was even had anything to do with the West Memphis Three matter at all, but the timing was really, really terrible. Mm. But it's West Memphis. So, I mean, seriously, <laughs> sometimes they're just, they've had some really sharp people there, and then some of the folks over there just don't have a clue. That's, it's true in most places, actually, when you start thinking about it.
Oh, we lost your audio, William. Yeah. Talking to myself. I'm I'm muted, so sorry about that. But it is interesting because Eccles, uh, he is claiming that Pope was let go specifically for his mistreatment or the way he handled the West Memphis three case. So I mean, you can see it right here on this post that I have. This is Pope and Eccles, and so it is. It is kind of you see the same cast cast of characters, the same kind of uh, you know what was me kind of manipulation in my opinion of events to put it all into context about how they were unjustly convicted. Wait, so Gary, what you're saying is this police chief was only in there for six months? Is that what you said? Yeah, he was only in there. I think he went in in July or August. So and when he, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just wondering. So when Eccles is saying that the way he handled the case, the way he handled the case for six months, that's why, and that's why he was fired. It's so sad. I can't really. Oh, you know, a, it's ridiculous. <laughs> This is another one from Eccles. This is a screenshot where he oh, is whoppers. stating that he has, um, this is a new one. I myself suffered brain trauma during the decade I spent in solitary confinement. So that's a new one. So in addition to his tooth problems and stuff, he has brain trauma now. No, so. uh, that's, this is the one that he's made before this brain oh, okay. trauma, brain trauma. Complaint, complaint. And it this one really enrages me. <laughs> Because, I mean, he said that um, he had bad teeth, his eyes were going. I mean, to real people who ha suffer from these ailments, it's such a, a insult. He claimed, <sighs> he, he claimed he had to learn to walk again. He claimed he had been forced to eat with his fingers all those years. Uh, he claimed he was beaten regularly by the, by, by the jailers. Uh, <laughs> It I'd almost sounds, believe it all sounds so good, right? Until you get into the details of it. And remember when he said he was at that show, he was watching a stand up comic and he realized he could relax and he wasn't going to get knifed at any right. minute. But it's a little hard to get knifed when you're the only one on death row when you don't have a cellmate. Huh. Right, solitary. Yeah. No, he's, <laughs> he's had some stories. Um, <laughs> He claimed he was the, he has claimed on numerous occasions that he was barely functional the first few years he was out of prison. And I, I do believe it, it probably was a huge adjustment for him, as it would be for anybody. But uh, he claimed that he was barely functional. And during those years, he was he was giving talk. He gave talk uh, some sort of talk at the U.N. He was touring the country. He was going to college campuses and giving talks. He was doing. He uh, was hanging out with Peter Jackson. He was traveling to Europe. He was working on a book. Uh, you know, he was giving lectures. You know, I mean, I should be so dysfunctional. <laughs> they need to be exonerated. Uh, they pled guilty, Lonnie. Little problem there. They're so, <laughs> yeah, they're old PR guys back. So he's talking about exoneration uh yeah so and there's another one by let me see if i can find the other one by yeah Suri. lonnie Suri has like um he has a million websites um wrongful confession.com i'm not saying that's exactly it but it's like things like wrongful conviction wrongful confession he's got a million websites that he's running all on this subject of wrongful convictions and he was also the pr rep for Ta uh, Marty Tankliff, who got himself off on a technique. He got he got his conviction um, vacated and they didn't retry it because of a bunch of things. But I have a episode about Marty Tankliff, which I'm pretty proud of, uh, called Did, uh, Did Nexium's Keith Ranieri's lawyer kill his parents? Because um, he was also, Marty Tankliff was the cult leader of Nexium lawyer for a wow, little bit amazing. there for about a year. Say. <sighs> yeah, crazy. So he and, and now he's got a discovery show where he's going to lead his class to investigate wrong, quote unquote, wrongful convictions, because that ended up so 
so great in Chicago with the all story Simon and Anthony Porter when they framed an innocent man in order to get a guilty one off death row and end the death penalty, which it did. But it was a total travesty of justice the other way. That ended up so well with a class of students. Now they you want to do it on the Discovery Channel. So it's just a money machine. But isn't that Bob Ruff's whole approach too? So he should just take his lessons from Bob Ruff. Isn't that Ruff trying to do it? Ruff tried to overthrow Adnan Syed. Now he's on to West Memphis Street. I don't know. What oh, he's, he's solving with. solved crimes. He oh, is yeah. out busy solving solved crimes. Never, never rests. His work is never done. I have some things to say to Bob Ruff. Um, we can bring him up <laughs> next. But if, yeah. yeah, we'll get there. But I think just okay. one thing before we move to Bob is that Sori is retweeting Mara Leverett, who anybody who thinks she's some kind of objective journalist, I think if you follow just the most recent stuff she's done in this case, it would disabuse you of that because she is really all in with Eccles and all these in Baldwin. And uh, I think that common... Commonly, the devil's not as supposedly the book of record for the West Memphis Three. I would highly recommend people read Carrie Meese's first book, Carrie Meese's books I'll, before I'll, hers. But, I, would, I would recommend Williams before hers. Or, well, honestly, there's a whole long list of people I'd recommend before her. I <laughs> know, but it's so here, crazy that so she's out good. there. She's out there. They, they have a movie made by based upon her book, so she probably got paid with that. And uh, she, it's just incredible. Like I followed her tweets, so let me just show a couple of tweets, and then we can go somewhere. Mm -hmm. just she one thing about her movie is th that her book is all about John Mark Byers being the real killer, and then they had to change it for the movie because they switched greeting stepfathers. Well, you, you know, she, did, she did a recent interview with with Bob Ruff, and about the first few minutes she was talking about how proud she was and remains that she did all this investigative work on John Mark Byers. I think it she still doesn't get it and never will obviously. She uh oh I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, you know, one, th one thing I was gonna say about salary is is I was sh really kind of surprised when I was working, I was working in West Memphis, which is on a daily paper there, but it was very tiny and it was really a job after I'd retired from the big paper in Memphis. And, and uh, I'd written some negative story, what would be perceived as negative stories about the West Memphis three, Eccles in particular. And all of a sudden I get a call from this publicist in New York who's all over me about how I've got it all wrong and how I need to start writing stories to, uh, really explaining what the truth is. And I'd done some research at that point. And I said, well, you know, I told him what I knew about the case. And he he finally just gave up on me. And then he later, I saw later posting where he said he's just given up on that guy. So, you know, uh, I, I never heard back from him. But it, to me, it was just shocking almost that they they had their finger on the pulse to that extent with the public publicity that anybody who didn't toe the line was going to get a phone call from Lonnie Sally to straighten them out. And most, most journalists would count out of that. They would simply go, Oh, sorry, I'll do better next time. I'm, I mean, that's just, that's just the truth because they don't do the research. That's right. True. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that's an important story because people don't see that what what's happening behind the scenes often that pressure is being put on journalists and things like that to, uh, Toe the line, like you said. But Mara Leverett, she's all in. These are December 27, 2021 tweet, tweets. And uh, anyway, I just, I to me, people just need to disabuse themselves of this notion that she's some kind of like objective journalist. In my opinion, she's not on the West Memphis 3 at all. So anyway. Oh, what, um, I, was, what I was gonna say about Mara is she co-wrote a book with Jason all about his adventures in prison. Uh, called Dark Spell. I, for some reason, I keep thinking it's Dark Star, but it's Dark Spell. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and it's it's uh, it's really a, a very uh, I consider it to be a very funny book because it's all about how Jason's like this big tough he man in prison and he's whipping up on people all the time. And it's just it's so absurd that it's really it really is funny. I know it's not written that way, but that's how I read it. <laughs> oh, 
It's so strange. Yeah. There, I, I had this one video of her and Jason Baldwin. I can't seem to find it. It's been so long since I've looked into this stuff, but they're together and she's talking. He, they're in some panel and she's like, I couldn't believe they're innocent. Nobody saw them muddy or anything like that. And seeing Baldwin or Eccles muddy at the scene of the crime was an essential part of the court case by that whole family that saw them. The Hollingsworth family saw them and she is just completely overlooking it. It's off the charts. I'm just like, when I saw that video, I wish I could bring it back up, but yeah. And then I have that other clip and uh, Roberta and I were talking about that uh, pre-show, which is her, uh, what is it? Pre, Pre-publication copy of her book, Devil's Not, was found in Eccles's garage or storage unit uh, that was, you know, revealed two or three years ago. So what's he doing with this kind of pre-publication version of Devil's Knot? So that was another crazy one. So anyway. Yeah, she sent him the, she sent the killer the book to fact check it. I mean, what's, it's crazy. That's right. And I'm almost positive that his lawyers um, fact checked it too. Fact check, Devil's Knot. Yes. Eccles lawyers did. Yeah. So it was uh, Reardon, I think it was his name. Oh, I can't, what was his last name? Dennis Reardon. Dennis Reardon. Honestly, a lot of that book, she's practically just channeling the defense attorneys and what their version of the case. And uh, you know, there's no, there's no even attempt at balance or anything else. That the defense attorneys and the private investigator Ron Lax, she's very tight with those people. She had, she was privy to all their what they considered to be all the vital information in the case from their perspective. Uh, but, you know, she just barely, she just barely gets into things like Eccles and his free trips to mental institutions in the year before he was charged in this murder. And all of those incidents were uh, involving violence. Threats of violence or actual violence, uh, including drinking blood, which is not normal teenage behavior, even for goths. No, his own parents were afraid of him. He's setting fires. He's attacking people. Uh, they thought he was going to hurt some of the kids in the house. I, I mean, uh, he's really uh, disturbed. If you haven't read um, Exhibit 500, then I really encourage everyone to because it's he's a very disturbed person. Right. At least it's, he was at this time of the crime. Uh, Exhibit 500 is, you know, it's over just for those who don't know, it's over 500 pages of medical records that was were introduced into the case by the defense uh, when they were in the, uh, it was a bifurcated trial where they had the, the they determined guilt, and then they determined sentencing. And the uh, defense brought that in, uh, I think it was Money Penny that brought it in, uh, Dr. Money Penny, uh, as some sort of mitigating, uh, Fact, these were going to be some mitigating factors in how the jury was supposed to view Eccles. And had this huge stack of papers there, and uh, the prosecution said, well, you brought all that. Is that evidence? And the, apparently the defense said, oh, yeah. And then next thing you know, there's all this information about how his, his parents thought he was into Satanism. And they lived with him. So, I, you know, maybe they don't know that. You know, they weren't particularly what well, they weren't educated at all, to be honest with you. But I think the father did go to, I'm, in fact, I know his father did attend some community college, but the, I don't think the mother made it past the seventh or eighth grade. The point being is they're not very sophisticated people. So I, what Eccles is actually doing is it's, uh, you know, it's probably up up for debate, but it, I don't think he's ever done anything in his life that didn't have some sort of a occult meaning or money, except for making money. If he could figure out some way to make easy money without doing something occult, he would do it, such as tattooing an X on somebody, which he was doing. <laughs> the fans were paying a hundred dollars a piece for an, uh, an X tattoo from uh, Eccles when he first got out of prison. Yeah. Yeah. There's pictures of him on social media with that, like smiling, like, Hey, I put my ex on like, Hey, nice work. But just so. the, I'm, if I were innocent, 
and it were just my word, if I had a conviction for murdering three children, I would not lie about anything because it's just my word of my innocence has to be remain trustworthy. And yet Echoes has lied in his book. He lies about Exhibit 500. He says it's something that the prosecutors put together, made up, put together when it's his defense team. I mean, so many. I, I could fill my channel with Echoes lies for at least two weeks. I think I'd have two weeks worth of shows. Uh, hour-long shows, at least. I, we could never go through all of them. And same thing with Amanda Knox. I mean, not to make this any bigger, but wouldn't you not want to get caught in this many, many lies? But he doesn't get caught. That's the thing. Is any, but any kind of mainstream journalism on this case is all about their innocence and they were wrongfully convicted because who would let out child killers onto the street, right? That's always the big, big... Uh, defense <laughs> defense right. answer right that's that's they wouldn't the big, let them out if they were weren't innocent that's the big gotcha in this supposedly and the truth is is scott ellington i mean terry hobbs was, i'm not going to tell you where i saw this because the interview show was so bad nobody should be forced to watch it but i did but <laughs> hobbs was in this interview and he says and Hobbs was actually good. It's the host. That's, he's awful. But anyway, Hobbs says that uh, Ellington told him he wanted to get, get off, get rid of the case because it was just too much trouble. And that, you know, people don't believe it, but it really, it, it, and to some extent, it was that true. It, it, it was, that was true. And that explains so much. It was also an 18 year old case at that time. No prosecutor wants to retry an 18-year-old case. There are too many things that can go wrong with evidence, with witnesses. Uh, one of the key witnesses uh, on the forensic evidence had died in the meantime. Uh, a lot of the, even the defense witnesses would have been very hard to find since they had jumped from one trailer park to some other trailer park, no doubt. Uh, the, um, they, I, I can emphasize this all the time, but Scott Ellington had political ambitions and Dustin McDaniel, the attorney general, had wanted to be governor. And Dustin McDaniel and Patrick Binker are the one who, ones who worked out this deal whenever it, uh, it turns out that the retesting of evidence in 2011 didn't turn up anything that was going to help the, the West Memphis Three case. And so Binker suggest that they can work out some sort of deal to get to bypass uh, the, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is we act, Oh, we actually have to go to court and show something. Let's do something else. <laughs> and so it, it, they end up doing the plea deal eventually. But um, the point being that there were political considerations. There was also the consideration if, if indeed any one of the three uh, was exonerated, uh, was, you know, got got a not guilty uh, verdict at the end of a retrial. If a re if there's no assurance that retrials were going to occur, and it was actually pretty unlikely in the Miss Kelly case, which raises all sorts of other questions. But because he was tried separately from them, and the evidence against him is different than the evidence against the uh, 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 Eccles and and Baldwin, and one of the prime allegations that they thought might give them a new new uh give them new, new trials was uh jury mis juror misconduct but that juror mis misconduct wasn't alleged to have gone down the missing case and then miss kelly had what, five or six confessions after he was convicted that were all on the record so i mean it would he i can't see the court ordering a retrial for him unless there was some really really strong uh evidence such as DNA evidence, and they didn't have it in 2011. We don't know what the results were, but we can, I, according to just the things that they were saying that were, are on the record, they didn't have it in 2011. They had, they were, they didn't have anything to go to the, the courts in December of that year. They got out in August. The evidentiary hearing was in December. They didn't have anything to take to the evidentiary hearing in December, ex except the hope that maybe the juror misconduct uh, 
allegation would somehow work in their favor. And that was not assured either. Uh, there, were pro there were problems and questions about that. I finally found the video of Leverett sitting with okay. Baldwin. You guys ready to watch this? This yeah. is something else. This is, this, this is from the archives. This is the Argenta Community Theater, 2012, right after they got out, or a year after they got out. Oh, let me do this. Hold on. Okay. You guys can't hear the audio, right? No. But no. I know exactly what she says. <laughs> You know, I really am not hearing anything. Well, I'll tell you what she said. She said, I was a mother and I didn't have, I knew that they, uh, children didn't come home, came home with, they said they didn't come home, have any evidence of mud on their clothes. And I knew that as a mother, that there was no, oh, no uh, chance of, uh, no chance. Chance come, coming home with, without mud on their, on their clothes. So. I don't know why the audio Wait. isn't working, but yeah, uh, I mean, like, no one saw them with mud. Not like the Hollingsworth family, like an entire family. Um, well, William Ramsey, who, you're muted. You, well, you know who was home with Jason that evening, right? It was a small time, petty, uh, really a career petty criminal named Dink Dent, who was his mother, his insane mother's new boyfriend except they broke up that night. So he wasn't around very long. And uh, he what he said that, you know, Jason came in so muddy and dirty so often, he just really wouldn't have paid any attention. And who are the other parents? Uh, Jesse Miskelly Jr.'s dad was at the DUI school that evening. And uh, so he wasn't there when Jason, Jesse would have gotten home. And uh, Echo's mother, it was caught has been caught in numerous lies and just outrageous statements, uh, you know, and this public statements she made statements she made to police. Uh, she was a terrible witness for her son. I mean, every it was just it was really kind of sad uh, that she uh, allowed herself to be subjected to that because they just ate her alive on the witness stand. She looked like a complete lying idiot. And then her son gets up and basically is just a, a, of a piece with that, except he's not really an idiot. So this is Lonnie Surrey talking about the Central Park Five here? Yeah, so you were talking about him. I, <laughs> I took some of these screenshots. So here he is with the Central Park Five. But watch this one, too. Here's one with Marty Tankliff. Here's the Marty Tankliff one. Let's see. So exoneree marty tankliff and derek hamilton exonerated five not the west memphis you know not the west central park five you and i've done a show on them too i've done a lot of shows on the central park five actually yeah Mar marty tankliff like has all this money basically they can't they decide not to retry him because they can't try him for the murder of his mother anymore it's 20 it's that's just why all these campaigns start 14 years later and on because witnesses have died just what um you guys were talking about witnesses have died uh people's memories aren't as good and if there is an eyewitness they will hound them and tell them there's an innocent man sitting in prison and it's just their <clears throat> word that's holding them, and they'll guilt the heck out of them until they change their story so it's crazy i don't know what in the central park five it's its own thing um no political thing Right. Uh, it just as as overlapping characters in story. Oh sure. Uh, they're so they're so guilty of so much that the idea that there's some these little innocent little angels is just it's so ridiculous. But people saw a Netflix movie, so now they know all about it. A fictional movie too, not a <laughs> theater documentary. It's like next level. Oh, well, I know, but even a feature film, you know, you would think might give a nod toward what the reality was. It, it wasn't even close, not even close. Gary, I'm glad you mentioned, mentioned that because Roberta and I were talking in the pre-show 
that uh, Berlinger, who did the three videos or the three documentaries for HBO, right, Paradise Lost, is being sued by Dershowitz over the um, over the Epstein show. I think it was, my, was it Filthy Rich or something like that. So Berlinger, it's like the dueling, uh, you know, ever-sized mountains of manure. Uh, Dershowitz on one side, Berlinger on the other, fighting each other in court. It's couldn't happen to worse people. Oh my God. No. Right. Absolutely. There was a bit of good news that I saw today and that Robert Durst died in prison. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. But nobody, no, I will say this, nobody, I, I don't think there's a wrongful conviction movement for Robert Durst and there's actually less evidence against him as far as a lot of it's just, he was here. Yeah. I mean, he had motive. Except for the except for the killing the the killing of his neighbor in Houston, I mean not Houston, like Corpus Christi, and he obviously did that. And you know he, I mean, he, you know he he just sort of weaseled out of that by saying, "Well, it was you know I didn't really mean to kill him, and I didn't mean to cut him up, I didn't need to throw his body out into the water." <laughs> right. But it's yeah, the like same he, cast of characters and all of these that go in and out, like uh, Richard Oshie is in this. Yes, yes. The, yes. He's in this. He's in Tank Lip. He's in um, uh, Loftus, is in the Maxwell trial. She's in basically every defense ever. She's on the Innocence Project website. Um, so the memory expert, and she was in the Durst trial where she got destroyed on cross. You can see it in a playlist. And um, the Durst trial was freaking fascinating. And because it was so long, not many people watched it. I just did an episode on it, but boy, is that a fascinating trial. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I watched quite a bit, but I couldn't, I didn't have time to watch all of it, honestly. All 60 days of it? What's going on, Gary? <laughs> What's wrong with you? I don't know. What's wrong with me is a better question, but I did watch most of it. Um, Roberta, do you want to move on to Bob, Bob Ruff? And do you, yeah, uh, I'd love what to, you want to talk about? Okay, Ruff. Someone sent Bob Ruff. Uh, is this what you want me to show? Lisa O'Brien on Twitter, and he wrote back, if that's where you're getting your info, meaning from me and my podcast, I now understand your perspective. Have you ever seen people work so hard to prevent being proven right? Oh, now I can't read it. Sorry. Well, okay, it's okay. Think about that. <laughs> so I'd like to respond. And have you ever seen someone work so hard to solve solved crimes ever? And 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 um, I have no problem if there was evidence that came forward. I would have no problem saying I'm wrong. But how long would you like me to wait? when there's six confessions plus from Miss Kelly and a whole lot of other evidence. I, I don't know. And they, they, and if you bring any of that up, they totally discount it all. I mean, they just simply don't even want to talk about it. And it, if you ask for like any kind of exonerating evidence, there really has, there's never been any exonerating evidence in this case, not even get anything close and they don't have any, but they'll still proclaim their innocence. Right. Uh, right. It's the so-called hair, though, right, Gary? The care of Terry Hobbs is the, uh, the so-called yeah. thing that makes sure that he did the whole thing. Yeah. And that's millions of people. So why aren't they going? <sighs> it's so frustrating. And but what that really means is, don't 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 listen to her or anything, any of the evidence that she presents. She's not trustworthy, and I am. I mean, that's really what he's saying. Bob Ruff in that state. Yeah, Bob. Bob's big thing is, as much as anything is, and I don't, I really don't listen. I haven't followed him at really much at all, except West West Memphis case. But I've tuned, I have tuned in occasionally. Sometimes it's a West Memphis update, and I have to listen to his noxious ads and so forth till I finally get around to the West Memphis stuff. But I will hear him complaining about the police corruption in this case and that case. Every time it's the fault of the police, you would think that the police were committing these crimes. I, and I know, I know I know, some policemen do that, but, you know, honestly, most of them don't. <laughs> it's interesting you say that. These guys do. The, the innocence fraudsters seem to do the same thing. Always blame the police 
where Berna and I did a, a show on Amanda Knox. And when she was interviewed by Joe Rogan, the first thing she did, the first major statement was against the police. They were working without evidence, on a whim, and he let her get away with that. It was unbelievable. The more I think about that interview, the worse it, it looks. It just was terrible. But um, that's really kind of their tactic. So it's it's the same tactic in the West Memphis Street. Yeah. Yeah. It's a conspiratorial mindset. So the police are planning evidence, even in something like the Stephen Avery case, where you have DNA that came from his sweat, that somehow yeah. the police can collect his sweat and, and drop it in the car. Um, they'll believe yeah, they have, or that the police are waiting while he's shaving that is another one of kathleen zellner's theories they're waiting to get blood from him and plan it i think it's a very i would think maybe even anti-authoritative mindset which i can sympathize with but it just doesn't hold water it's broad strokes and once you yeah. get into the um specifics like if Terry Hobbs did this, then what's the blue wax evidence? Is Terry Hobbs running through the woods with a candle, like a pitchfork in one hand and a candle in another? Or what, what's going on? You know, um, the what to me, that's the best. If they were actually to retest this evidence, I just I it's not that I'm against retesting the evidence as such. I just don't think they have any legal avenue to do it. But uh, if they ever do retest it, I really want to see the results from the what appears to be a semen stain on Stevie Branch's pants uh, that they just couldn't get really. They got were able to identify enough of it in in uh, back at, at when the cases were originally tried to determine. That, oh yeah, this it has all these earmarks for being semen, and you know these are eight year old boys. They just you know, they're not very likely sources of that. And uh, so it came from an adult of some sort. Jesse Miskelly describes Eccles, you know, ejaculating over one uh, over the, over Stevie's body and wiping his wiping himself off on his pant on the boy's pants. Uh, I would really like, you know, go test the DNA on that and see who come see whose DNA it matches. And if they can't get that DNA, I mean, how great is this MVAC uh, extraction method if they can't d get DNA from that? What well, don't um, you think the timing is, as the young people say, sus? Because isn't the isn't it timed out? Aren't they legally timed out? They wait yeah. till the end of their probate, their parole period. Yeah. And well, they 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 did they did that too. In fact, uh, you know, it all seemed to to they raised it to a pitch back in June and July and with it, uh, the uh, parole period ended in a uh, probation period ended in uh, uh, mid August. And as, as far as the, as far as the state of Arkansas is concerned, it's a closed case. And, it, and it's been that way for a long time, but you know, Part of part of the they have a number of legal impediments to having it retested, and one of it one of the impediments, it's not just for them, it's for uh, any of these cases is uh, timeliness, and they ha just simply haven't been timely in in uh, seeking uh, uh, you know retesting if they were ever going to do that, they waited around and waited around until Bob Ruff came up with the idea, uh, Eccles Baldwin and Ms. Kelly have not made one effort to determine who actually killed, I won't say the boys' names because I don't want to go through the whole thing without saying their names, Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Christopher Byers. He, they've not made one effort in 10 years to even, you know, and they, when they got out, they said, oh, we're gonna, they're gonna do an OJ and find the real killers. And it, they didn't do anything. They didn't, uh, they have, so they have a, a lot of power in this, the same sort of sense that Bob Ruff has a certain kind of power and that they can call on people uh, interested and motivated people to work on their behalf, but they've never done anything with that except get money. Jason, that's how Jason gets money. That's how uh, Eccles gets money. Yeah. Miskelly just doesn't have any money apparently. <laughs> right. 
and he's the one with the most um, conscious, the conscience. Uh, he might be the only one that even has a conscience. As as <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So this kind of movement of the retrying the evidence, would you two agree that this was just a furtherance of trying to win the court of public opinion and yes. also as a money grab as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. PR, PR, marketing and spend and, and money. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, will, I will say one more thing. I noticed I, I was looking through e Eccles uh, uh, social media the other day, just doing some prep. And I noticed that he had he announced he, back uh, a year, a little bit over a year ago, I think it was that he was opening. No, it wasn't a year that he he was opening this magical school in uh, New Orleans. And he announces he's opening a Venmo account. So if you want to send me some money to help me out with this school, you know, here it is. And you know what? He hasn't said a word one about that school in months and months and months. Wow. I didn't know that. So that's probably the picture. Does he have a name for it? Because I think I saw Magnum Opus. Magnum Opus. That's it. The great work. I see. That makes sense. I thought he was in front of like a winery or something. Now that makes perfect sense. Oh, okay. The, the other sad one is there's like a picture of him in social media doing zip lining and it's just like <laughs> grotesque. Like he's got three kids who are dead and he's out zip lining in Florida or something like that. Yeah. Wow. So that's it. So Magnum Opus, I guess he's on the, okay. Is he on the road? I don't know. Yeah, he is. You know, I, I, he was to last time I checked until a day or so ago, and he probably still is. Yeah, he's out uh, touring uh, all the wonderful. Looks like it's mostly in the South so far, at least. But uh, he's been touring all these different places in the South. Mm -hmm. It's on West well, Memphis. Three facts has it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and and while he's touring the South and while well, intermittently posting about his PTSD. We still got the PTSD, gotcha. Oh, it's bad. It's real bad. On, he, on Facebook, I meant. I'm sorry. Oh, so that's good. He news. probably will never recover from that PTSD. Oh, yeah. He'll never recover from the PTSD, his blindness, his bad teeth, his, his almost dying. There it is, yeah. There's a zip line here. He's so brain damaged by prison that he's terrified of the simple fact that exists in brain function at all. Other days he's zip lighting. Wow. There's you, Gary Meese. Yeah. I, I did a I did an interview with uh, Joshua Diaz not too long ago on this case too. And Josh is really he's he might have it in more for uh guilt than I do at this point. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can go 101% on this or not, but <laughs> he might be there. He's a good, he's a good guy too. Yeah, he really definitely. is. Definitely. So that, I'll put that in the show notes too. I'll put that, that YouTube uh, interview. Sounds like you went a couple hours with him. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, let me see if anybody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions for the guests? Do you guys have anything else you'd like to cover? Anything else relating to this or anything you want to promote? Gary, you have, I showed your um, podcast this year, The Case Against with Gary. Yeah. Mace. So yeah. You can see some of the stuff, the recent stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm probably going to limit uh, what I post in the future on that to new developments in the case. Since I've covered the case to death on there and uh, I'm not think I, I don't think I've done it all that well, but I, I'm probably done it about as well as I'm ever going to do. Uh, just from a technical talent standpoint. And Roberta just keeps cranking out great stuff all the time. Yeah, yeah. I just did an episode on Mamiya Abu-Jamal, who's had a 40-year innocence campaign. Killed uh, Officer Daniel Faulkner with uh, T. Gray Hill, who did a fantastic documentary about, about it. It's a really interesting interview. Um, I, I watched that. I watched that on your recommendation, and 
It's it's really quite touching to hear. Uh, I can't think of the officer's name, but his his widow in particular talking about how Faulkner. mistreat. Yeah, yeah, how mistreated she's been by the, all this. It reminds me of how mistreated the West Memphis three, the, not the West Memphis three parents, but the parents of the dead boys have been mistreated by the media. And in their case, really abused by the Paradise Lost people to, as well. It was, it was unconscionable what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sickening, really. Yeah, this is a movement that really hurts victims and victims' families. And you'll never hear anyone in that side say, lay off, respect the victims' families, or don't go after them, don't bother them, or any anything like that. Or It's just... They, they, they're made to feel afraid. It's awful. Yeah. It's really yeah. awful. I mean, it's hard, you know, when I first went into this, I really thought everybody was sort of do-gooders who were sort of misguided, but I don't feel that way. At least, at, at least at the people leading the, leading the movement really involved. No, I think, there are, guys, of, uh, I think there are a lot of sincere, but mi grossly misled people who really, aren't going to bother or really do much research, but they like the idea that they're doing good by supporting uh, the wrongful conviction movement. And there are some wrongful convictions, but they're not nearly, you know, they grossly overstate what the statistics show so far. I mean, there's not that many people that get out on, you know, every time this happens, it becomes some sort of media splash, but there's really not that many of them. And, well, uh, you know, there, there, but there are some and it's great. I, you know, I think I, I mean, I think the Innocence Project actually started out with a really good idea. Let's retest DNA that's available in these cases and see if the DNA matches uh, the, the guy that's in prison for this rape or this murder. And they did some good work. But, you know, it averages out if you look over their total total career it averages out to less than one a month over the 30 years or so they've been doing that. So there's not a huge number of those cases. And those cases are rapidly going away, drying up literally in every other way because people DNA testing has now become routine. Well, it wasn't routine back when, when they first started. So they've got to find something else. So they do, they do BS like post Stephen Avery on there as, as a case uh, you know, of wrongful conviction. And and then also they they claim Anthony Porter in Chicago who is totally when they who they framed all story Simon both of them um, Anthony Porter is now dead um, I can't say sadly but dead um, but before that they put him on the exoneration list when all story Simon got out the judge said Anthony Porter did this he's very guilty. So um, they also include, they also test, retest the DNA. And when it comes back with the killer's DNA, they keep representing the client in the cases of Purvis Payne, uh, Kevin Cooper case, same thing, same thing with the Julius Jones case. They press on. They never, they don't, they don't say, okay, you're guilty. They never say guilty, that group, ever. Never say, never say guilty. Nope. Mm -mm. Do you guys want to take a quick question? Hill Doggy asked, why do they keep attacking Terry Hobbs as the culprit? Does anybody want to answer that? Because they can. Because it's useful to them. It, it also because they can, can, they're in love with the idea, they seem to be in love with the idea of physical evidence, and they imagine that this hair is physical evidence against Terry Hobbs. Well, it's it's if it's it's not. I mean, it's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, it, it can, you know, there are millions of people in the United States that that have the same mitochondrial DNA. There are hundreds of people in West Memphis that have mito the same mitochondrial DNA. And even if it is Terry Hobbs' hair, all three boys were in his house that day, and it, and I think Terry probably actually thinks it's his hair. I think he s said more or less that. But, it, it, but he's also said, and I agree with him, that uh, it's perfectly explainable as transference, which is a big, big problem with all DNA evidence. All these DNA evidence cases, all contamination and uh, 
transference and just the way that DNA can be transmitted. You shake, you could shake hands with somebody and then go murder somebody and you leave that guy's DNA on the doorknob. You know, it's, it, you know, not many people get convicted of anything on that basis, but you see where that's going. It creates problems. It's a great tool, but it's just a tool. You have to look at the t t totality of the evidence and not just this one little thing. And they've got the one little thing here that's about the one littlest thing you can possibly imagine, which is a little tiny hair from that might or might not be from Terry Hobbs. That's it. Right. And I interviewed Terry. I think his book is Box Full of Nightmares, I think is the book. So you can listen to that on my podcast. And I mean, I think it's pretty clear. It was very worthwhile. And if you look at the documentaries, they went from one father to one stepfather to the next stepfather. And they ended up with Terry Hobbs, but the one the other guy. What was the other guy's name who passed John away? John Mark Byers. John Mark Byers, thank you. Yeah. I thought he was the better. <laughs> <laughs> the better potential culprit. You know. I mean, they're both ridiculous, but yeah. if you're going to the, the problem with John Mark, the problem with Mark Byers, it, well, it's a couple of things. One thing he was putting on an act, he was getting paid to do that act. And he's basically, he was exploited like everybody else. He was happy to take the money and he put on a good show. See the second Paradise Lost for Full Tilt Crazy. But, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is, uh, Oh, what was I going to say? I got off on John. John Mark Byers is just one, one of the most fascinating movie characters you'll ever encounter. He really is. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. There's a question he here about why, why did they ignore the fact that Eccles in the making of that making of a murderer, freak or dog and cat killers, killing pets is a stepping stones to killing humans. Uh, it's also part of the dark triad that's common to psychopaths along with bedwetting and setting fires. We know Eccles set fires. He did it at school on several occasions. We don't know if he wet the bed. We know he but killed he animals. He's on the bedwetting drug, too. He was on that um, impyramine drug that they give people for bedwetting. Yeah. I've often yeah. wondered if, it, if that was and, well, or if that was just a coincidence. It's an antidepressant. It's, it's also an antidepressant. It's so an antidepressant. Right. And yeah. the, reason, the reason they ignore that fact is because the same reason they ignore all the other inconvenient facts in this case, because, uh, and this one particularly strikes home a lot of people because naturally enough, they love animals. The idea of somebody viciously killing an animal is abhorrent to most normal people. But for somebody like Damien, eh, it's just a good time. Just like killing those three little boys was a good time for Jason Baldwin. Taking the knife, he loved it, apparently. He, he was very disappointed, apparently, when uh, Miss Kelly wouldn't let him carve up Michael Moore. And he had a strange can, answer. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you can see him in the movie. He said, um, I was just watching a little clip of it the other day where he said, we just got together and whatever happened, happened. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. I mean, is that an admission? What is he talking about? There, there's all sorts of stuff in those movies that make him look guilty as hell if you just want to look at it the right way. Right. Well, one it of the happen. interesting things in the second Paradise Locks is that John Mike Byers is there, but both Baldwin and Eccles state with 100% certainty that he's the uh, Byers is the one who did it. And that's very telling for a variety of reasons because... They pivoted once it was buyers and it moved to Hobbs, which was a much better, uh, you know, fake culprit. But uh, it's, I know they're what, on the record stating that. I know what I was going to say about uh, Hobbs, not Hobbs, a uh, buyers is that he had a great alibi. So the idea that he was somehow a credible killer, they get around the ones with the conspiracy theories get around that with these bizarre theories that they were placed down a manhole and, uh, you know, he snuck back into the woods at night and finished the job and all this other crazy stuff. And uh, but he had a great alibi for all that time when the boys almost certainly were killed. Somebody here says laundry mixes family members, hairs and DNA. Yeah, that's another good example of just the, the problems that can occur with a DNA. Somebody has a question for you, Roberta. Have you heard of the Don Coons cold case in Bakersfield, California? You heard of that case? No, I'll check that out. Thank you. No. Paula Zong is involved in that. Yeah. 
take Interesting. Who ties to David who? I don't know. That's uh, Paul Zorana's ties to David, you know, David Berkowitz, Roy Radin. Oh, okay. Ties Interesting. to the factors of the witch in this particular book. Oh. Power and influence of celebrity supporters, big problem. That's very true. Very much involved in this case. I mean, that's one thing Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard got right. They said, get all the, we'll legitimize this new religion by getting a bunch of celebrities at work. Celebrity endorsements work. I mean, that's essentially what it is, is a celebrity endorsement of three child killers of their innocence, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really notable, too, that all the celebrity support that Eccles in particular was trumpeting in the early days. Some of the celebrities were really a very questionable character, to put it nicely. But he was hanging around with like major, like the biggest movie maker in the world, practically Peter Jackson, and certainly in New Zealand, he's pr uh, practically a national hero. Uh, they actually, oh, he wasn't really supposed to be able to even be able to come into that country. But Peter Jackson had so much power that they just let him bring in this convicted child killer. Uh, wow, that's but you know, all that celebrity support has just. Uh, if if it's there, it's totally dried up. I you don't see any of that going on anymore with any of the three. Not that any of them were ever hanging out with Jesse Miskelly Jr. Yeah, where is um um I I thought um one of them I, I don't know. I just heard on the Crazy Days and Nights podcast that Eccles stayed with some celebrity and that, that he was so freaky. I can't remember. I thought it was Eddie Vedder, but I'm not sure. I'd have to listen. Uh, was that Baldwin lived at Eddie Vedder's house. And I think it's maybe it's in Seattle uh, and it's oh. up in the Northwest. But anyway, he, that party was he, mixing when he first got out of school, first got out, of, not out of school, out of prison. But, uh, and he occasionally will mention Eddie Vedder now like happy birthday, Eddie Vedder, but is Eddie Vedder wishing, Jason Baldwin, happy birthday. That's the more relevant question. Yeah, I, I don't, you don't hear anything, not even from the real diehard true believers. I mean, there was levels in those celebrities of supporters like Peter Jackson. Right, had to be right. Peter Jackson, Johnny Natalie Depp, Mains. Johnny Depp, jo Natalie Maines. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the two big bank rollers were Jackson and Depp my understanding of the legal the legal elements of this case yeah and jackson you know that's just pocket change to him but he apparently dropped millions into the case and yeah, uh, millions, yeah. i think he was probably the the most the biggest source but uh you know johnny depp had pretty deep pockets then too so yeah. right and this is a really fascinating picture of peter jackson because he has eccles Theban alphabet circular tattoo on his left arm. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> and Eccles is, has given these to uh, Depp and some other characters. Like he and Depp share multiple tattoos. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. So, so you think he's a Satanist, Peter Jackson? Or is he a dupe? Is he, is he, a, I'm asking, is he a fellow traveler? Or is he know. someone who was so convinced he thinks this is just, he's doing it? His expression is so strange. It's a very strange expression. And I think that's Eccles behind him wearing all black. You can kind of see him on his left shoulder. Uh, I think he's but, probably I think he's probably just stoned or something. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, know. It's an odd expression. <laughs> There's a rumor that Eccles he put Eccles into uh, like an orc outfit and put him in one of the Lord of the Rings movies or Hobbit movies. You guys ever hear that? Oh wow. that's what I heard. I, I think I heard something about that even fairly recently. I just don't know where I heard it from. He typecasting, right? Eccles is on the It's so true. So true. I mean, there's a really, there's all these other pictures too. Here's another one that I have. This is from my, uh, this is from my back of the old days files when I was researching this much more, but this is, all the cast of characters again. This is Eccles before his tattoo. So I think he had just gotten out of jail. And there's Benka and Sori and Jackson signing the West of Memphis, you know, pity party uh, documentary that Eccles made, I think, with Jackson's assistance. Something like that. Yeah. 
Oh, oh, I've never seen that, or I don't remember seeing that. If I have, no, oh, I got some other picture. good ones. You want to? Yeah, that's when they they were promoting West of Memphis at this time too, which was, you know, a movie about a wrongful conviction case that's produced by the guy who supposedly was wrongfully convicted. <laughs> By, right. by, a, by a, a child killer, a paroled child yeah, killer, a child killer, producer. Jeez. I doubt if he did much, but, you know, they got a name on there. No, they got him as executive producer status, and that's enough. Unbelievable. I mean, there's tons of pictures. I mean, I have tons of pictures of them together. Oh. But that hasn't been tatted up yet. I didn't know Peter Jackson was a, a, a hobbit, but he's really not very tall, is he? doesn't seem to be well how tall is Eccles? he's not that tall he looks taller than he is i think he, i think he measured it i think he was five nine five ten which is very average height when he was arrested and he was 18 at the time what's interesting is uh, it's a little deceptive but Baldwin's almost as tall as he is he just always looked a little because he's so scrawny in those uh, oh, that's know, interesting. Little, little pipe stem arms that convinced Joe Berlinger he couldn't have possibly committed a murder. This is Auckland, August 2nd, 2012. So almost a year after they've been out, Eccles, Eccles is telling a sob story, I guess, to all these people in oh. the Civic Theater in Auckland. Yeah. I wish I could yeah. play the audio. Yeah. I can't figure yeah. out how to play the audio. Yeah, he was getting a lot of... Uh, a lot of pub, well, not that's probably the biggest he had, but he was getting some fairly good sized public venues back then. He was making, he was raking in quite a bit of money going to colleges and speaking for ten and twenty thousand dollars at these colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, that all's gone away. Right. And you know, when you start announcing you're a ceremonial magician and you were convicted <laughs> in a case, in a case, in a satanic panic case in which. Right. It was alleged you ritually murdered three boys, you know, and people start having slight second thoughts whether they say anything or not. It's just hard to get a with coat, you know, the illness. It's hard to get a sense of what his life was like in New York at the end there. There was a while where he was hanging out with the tattoo people. He seemed to have art friends and he doesn't seem to be able to hold his friendships. <laughs> you don't he even see him you know, around Johnny Depp. No, he doesn't follow through with a lot of his, he does follow through with his, he's been following through with his, his lectures on uh, the occult and he just keeps knocking those out. So he's, <laughs> he, he's very committed to that, but all his other side projects just don't go anywhere. His Reiki stu hermetic Reiki studio in Salem was just a total bust. His yeah. art, he, he was an artist for a while and he just gave it up. And uh, he doesn't seem to, you know, friends come and go. So yeah, I don't know. Amanda I, Knox is like that too. She quits everything she does. So. Yeah, she does sort of run through stuff, doesn't she? There's Depp, Berlinger, and Eccles. Oh, that's I another picture that I've never seen. Or, yeah. I got some yeah. good ones. And There's a mutual. Yeah. Let's see the mutual tattoo. Maybe because I'm blocked <laughs> on all social media. That might be it. I've got some good ones. I got. Where's the one? I wish I could find the one with them having the tattoo together. Oh, here's here's Depp with Eccles tattoos. Let's see. Here's a, here's a good question from, and a rhetorical question from the lab. Hi, Josh. Uh, did Damien summon the court for the new testing of old evidence? No, <laughs> he says no need to answer my question. Of course he didn't. <laughs> right. This is the this is I mean because you know there are no rules in 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 presenting your case on social media on in the media uh, in a in a documentary, but uh, our legal system is quite different. There, there is um, consequences for lying under oath. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I mean, I was privy to how news is gathered and so forth for a long time and how it can be spun. So I, I knew it on, on a, a fairly deep, deeper level than most people uh, prior to really studying this case. 
this case can really be an education in how how media can distort uh, the information that you you think you're getting you're getting this information and it looks good. It just turns out to be totally fallacious. And it's really uh, true. And it's not that hard to do. Uh, I, I think, uh, I don't know, Berlinger's talents really showed up in a lot of his other projects, if he's got talent. But I, I still think Paradise Lost is really uh, in its own way. And I ha sort of hate them. I do hate the movie, but I do think it's extremely well made and compelling and uh, much more so than anything else he's done. But uh, it's but it's amazing. It's an amazing piece of propaganda is what it is. And once you start, right. and when you start seeing that, you start. Next thing you know, you're watching the uh, uh, the fictionalized version of the web, of the uh, Central Park Five. And you're like, <laughs> what really happened here? Uh, nothing like what I just saw. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Exactly. I was fooled by the by the um, Paradise Lost movies. So. Yeah, this is a good one. This is Depp and Eccles. I can't remember what year this is, but they are like oh, walking in so just to, to applause. There's just, just screaming and applause walking into a book signing. I would have loved to, as a non, to have been at this. And <laughs> everybody's smiling. Oh, here he's comes a, the child killer. He's a, a hero. They're roped off. Sign my book. And, oh, gosh, that's so creepy. But they also love to put these things. A lot of his events were paid for events, so they keep the non-believers out and the critical questions out. Yeah, I've, I've never uh, seen any interview with Eccles that proposed anything like a critical question to him. Uh, uh, you know, it was pretty clear even back when he was on uh, Larry King. Well, Larry didn't know any, Larry didn't know anything about most of the people he ever interviewed except. You know what he just picked up in the first last ten five minutes before he went on the air, but you know you could tell that that he was just going to simply fall for anything that Eccles told him. But that was the case in almost every interview that he's ever given. And then you read something in the New York Times or the Guardian, you think these people really should have higher standards than this. These are supposed. This is supposed to be top level, the very best of the best, and they they still fall for this, this ridiculous narrative that this guy's uh, wrongfully convicted. I mean, oh, and, and you I've try seen, to argue with them, like someone from the New Yorker where they don't even get a comma wrong. They, they pride themselves in and they say, Oh no, we can call them wrongful or, or exonerated by DNA evidence. That's what I was taking. They were. They they were. Were. No, uh, because DNA evidence had something to do with it because they gave it, they cleverly gave a press conference right before they asked for the Alfred plea and took it. Uh, that's and then talked about DNA exonerating DNA evidence that it had something to do with their Alfred plea. Right, and that was some masterful misdirection by some yep. very talented, high-priced attorneys. Yep, and that's that's all it was. It really it, there was nothing substantive about it. I know several journalists who were totally taken in by simply being at that press conference. Wow. Terry Hobbs try Perry Terry Hobbs did try for to uh, sue uh, Natalie Maines for defamation of character and it ended in a huge disaster for Terry. So I don't think he's going to be doing it again anytime soon. So he's living up in the Ozarks, enjoying life and not worrying about a whole lot. He's I, I, he does a He's making some poor choices in who he does interviews with. Other than that, Terry's doing okay. And I'm not saying that like I'm his big buddy because I'm not, but you know, I don't have anything against the guy either. So yeah, DR Piper says exactly, Gary. I don't believe Eccles has been subjected to a tr single true journalistic interview. Nope. No. And Baldwin hasn't either, I, as far as I know, but not that many people have really wanted to talk to Baldwin. So that's, he's had it a little bit easier. Guys, we are at 90 minutes. I have to wrap this up. Uh, where's the best place to get your books, Terry, and listen to your podcast? Uh, the books are available on Amazon. And uh, the podcast is, you can find it on uh, the Apple uh, 
Apple podcast and, uh, and uh, I think, and uh, last time I checked, and it's also on um, Podbean. Podbean too. Yeah. I think you originally put your stuff up on Podbean so people can check that out. Yeah. But here it is again. Yeah. Yeah. Case again. Just, it's on Apple Podcasts. I was just listening today. So. Cool. Okay. And then uh, Roberta Glass, you can also find on Apple Podcast, but also listen to her streams and interviews at Roberta Glass True Crime Report. What do you have on the horizon, Roberta? Other than your excellent job, by the way, with the whole Maxwell uh situation so that was really thank awesome you. you did a great job thank you i'm going to continue on that um and uh there um i'm having you on for hopefully for my fourth year anniversary I know, looking uh, forward to it. And, yeah but i have a bunch of good stuff coming up a bunch of good stuff coming up so stay tuned cool. yeah people can go back and look at the uh, maxwell stuff you and i talked about the amanda knox case four weeks that's ago a so really that's fun episode yeah you, you did some really really great stuff on uh maxwell case i mean yeah. not saying the other stuff you do hasn't hasn't been great but it's just really outstanding Thank and you. you know especially being a, I, an eyewitness to what's going on in the trial it's just fascinating stuff yeah, yeah. Thank you. so one last question from chartreuse anybody has Eccles ever feigned empathy for those boys or has all his pity been reserved for himself I mean, that's <sighs> You answered your own question. It's all for himself. There, nobody else exists. He, you know, I think he may have occasionally have said, given some sort of weak thing like, oh, it's too bad about those poor boys. That's about it. And it's that's been very rare. Uh, I haven't seen any of that from uh, Jason Baldwin either. Uh, so, you know, they, they don't want to get involved in that. And then Miss uh, Skelly's probably hidden deep in the crawl space. Yep, that's very true. Keeps a very low profile. I think he had a DUI or some kind of drug arrest he, within the last two or three years. He, he was arrested for, it, you know, it may not sound like a big deal, but he was driving, he was convicted, he was caught driving without a license like three times in the space of like three or four months, which gets to be a big deal when you do it three or four times that quickly. But he's generally stayed out of trouble since then. But, you know, he's going back. To, he's in as far as anybody knows, he's in the crawl space that he came out of to begin with, which is uh, Highland Oaks Trailer Park. Uh, his, his dad died not that long ago. And uh, I don't know the status of uh, the estate, but he was living in his dad's trailer, a nasty trailer and a nasty, nastiest, one of the nastiest trailer parks you'll ever see. Uh, drove through there not many times, but enough times. And uh, it doesn't look any better now than it did. I, the last time I went through that, it didn't look any better than it did the first time I drove through there. Let's put it that way. And that's where he lives. He's basically just a, a trailer park kid who just happened to get caught up in this. I mean, I'm not trying to write him off. He is a killer. I, I just don't think he, he, I don't see him ever. He might've be, he liked beating up little kids, but uh, I don't see him ever getting committing this sort of crime without some sort of instigator pushing him on. And uh, it was a really a fatal mix with those three. I got a self-diagnosed sociopath, another one who probably is one, but you know, it's re resolutely <coughs> rejected any kind of psych psychiatric uh, examination. And then you've got Miss Kelly, who's just kind of dumb as a brick, but you know, um, yeah, it's a lethal combination. That's for sure. Leslie, anything you guys want to finish I'm with? Not. I'm, I'm hoping not, um, but I don't think so. But I'm, there's a chance. There's always a chance when there's an appeal. So I'm just answering Leslie H. really right, quickly. So, uh, gotcha. Not to hold you. Neutral. Okay. No, no problem. All right, guys. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Again, it's Thank Gary you, Meese. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, the case against with Gary Meese and Roberta Glass of the True Crime Report. Thanks so much for your time. Always good to. Always good to. See both of y'all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye -bye. Stay there. Stay there.